Welcome, everybody, to the uh, Bonner Milltown History Center Roundtable. Uh, this is the uh, 15th year that we've been doing these roundtables, and this is the 36th program. Um, they, the pr roundtables date back to 2009, and uh, all the programs were uh, recorded by MCAT, who is uh, recording it today. And uh, in due course, they will be available on our website and also on YouTube. The one that was done in January on the mill and th this property uh, will be available soon. Um, it's not there yet, but it will be available soon. Um, we, we are also on the, I should acknowledge that we're on the ancestral homeland of the Salish and Kootenai or Pondre people who've lived here from time immemorial. We offer our respect for their history and culture and for their enduring, enduring care and protection of our shared lands and waterways. Um, I will mention also that we have one more round table coming up in March, uh, but it's at St. Anne's Catholic Church next to the school in Bonner. And it will be, Bill Taylor will be speaking on the building of the railroads uh, in uh, the immigrants who build it, built Montana's railroads. And, um, then it's going to be followed by a pasty dinner, uh, which is either you can eat it there or you can take it out. Um, some quick notes here. The men's bathroom is over here, and the women's is in the back towards the wall. Um, and uh, there is a food truck outside. Uh, which um, has hamburgers and beer dogs. And so if you're hungry, you should could go out there. And um, if you want a beer, um, just raise your hand and the people at the desk uh, at the bar will come and uh, take your order and bring it to you. Um, so thanks again to MCAT, Ron Scholl has been um, the one who's produced all these programs for us and uh, it will be aired on MCAT's channel 189 a month from now and then download loaded to its video on demand. Thanks, too, to the Kettle House. This is the f fifth program here, and um, the support we've re received and interest in the history of the p place are phenomenal. We hope that you can return that support today and in the future. It's a wonderful addition to the, this town. And they offer beer and, as you know, and snacks, and today with the food truck, the cop beef. Also, thanks to Friends of Two Rivers who sponsor the Bill, Mill, Bonner Milltown History Center and Museum, and to Walter Peck, Peckham, faithful sound engineer, uh, and f finally to Steve Nelson and Mike Bohm and Mike Heisey for, for providing a home for the History Center in the uh, building next to the post office. So um, we have three programs there regularly. Tuesdays from 9 to noon, a coffee group meets for conversation and cookies. And on Wednesdays, we're open to the public from 10 to noon. And on Fridays, a group interested in old roads meets regularly, and they always welcome new people. Um, so, um, 
I'm going to turn it over to Kim Brigaman, who's going to give you an introduction to the Mullen statue uh, that uh, has been in Missoula and Bonner. So I'll turn it over to Kim. Thank you, Miney. Before I introduce our speaker today, um, I, a couple of things I want to mention in relation to the Mullen Road. Um, one is that we, Missoula, for the first time in, I think, nine years, is going to be um, hosting the Mullen Road Conference um, in June, June 9th through 11th. It's going to be mainly out at Heritage Hall. Is, is where our programs are going to be. It'll feature, as, as Mullen Road conferences always have, um, a bus trip and, and this year some hiking, hiking the road type thing. So you might keep that on your radar June 9th through 11th. Um, we're, we've been asked too if, uh, if you want a beer and you don't feel comfortable getting up to the counter, just raise your hand, they'll keep an eye out for you and uh, come, come and get your order and um, you can pay either afterwards or have, hand them your money there. So, so we can keep the beer flowing here. And of course, for the first time we've got cop, cop beef out in the parking lot and uh, you should try it. <laughs> so, so um, my, my duty here is I, because while well, the Mo John Mullen and the Mullen Road are are p p definitely a part of Missoula's history, they are just as important to the story of Bonner. John Mullen first crossed the Blackfoot over here in, in 1853 as part of the Isaac Stevens Railroad Survey, and he was in this this neighborhood several times before he established the winter camp of 1861-62 and he lived here in cantonment right during that during that winter and built the first bridge across the blackfoot so it seemed uh it was fitting that his place this place became the site of one of the mullen monuments when they were conceived of and came about in the World War I era that, that Leif will be talking about in a few minutes here. Um, so on <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> do, you want, do you want me to wait? <laughs> do I really sound that bad? <laughs> So anyway, um, on, uh, on October 4th, 1917, the Mullen Monument in, in our, our Mullen Monument was uh, dedicated at the mouth of the Blackfoot River. And it was one of seven that in Montana that were uh, actually designed and built here in Missoula. Uh, ours, and I'm going to call it ours, was uh, donated by, sponsored by W.A. Clark. He wasn't at the dedication, but um, let, me, let me read how I want to say this. Um, this actually is at the base of the, of the monument, and it's hard to read, but it says, erected under the auspices of the Montana Society of Pioneers, contributed by Senator W.A. Clark, A.D. 1915, is when they begin be, to be designed. Ours was the last of seven in Montana that were dedicated in 1917. But it didn't stay there, as most of you know, or maybe, maybe you don't. Um, along came the automobile. And while this, this monument was very visible from the tracks there at the base, there at the base of, of uh, the Blackfoot River, 
um, it, it wasn't very visible from the highway, which, which is where it is now, basically, and the streetcar. So um, in 1940, I'm thinking six, maybe, somewhere in that area, um, it was moved, no, actually it was 1950, 1954, never mind. It was moved into town. Now this is a picture probably in the 1920s of, of these ladies standing and posing. There's some things wrong with this picture and one is the spilling of mullen, M-U-L-L-A-N. People tend to get that wrong all the time. Um, this was part of the Jack Demons um, history uh, photo collection and he wrote, I assume it was Jack that wrote that on, on that that this statue was moved to East Missoula or just beyond the tracks in East Missoula uh, on the way into Missoula at one time. It wasn't. I was always confused on that too. The, the only move prior to coming back out here was to, to Missoula and maybe you remember it. Um, it was at the junction of Front Street and Orange Street across from KECI in that, in that triangle area. Um, and then in, 19, in 1997, Jimmy Willis, one of the founders of our Bonner, History, Bonner Milltown History Center, um, he suggested to the newly formed Bonner Development Group that we get our statue back. This is 1997 now. So Bruce Hall visited with Mayor Dan Chemis to get the wheels turning, and as the months went along, locals such as, as Ken Piers, um, Al Belushi, uh, my dad, Martin Brigham, helped Bruce keep the momentum going. Bruce recalls attending several board meetings of Missoula's City County Historic Preservation Office, which was dragging its feet when it came to approving the relocation of the statue. The concern was that who would take care of it when it got out here. Finally, the board member, Bob Oakes, said, it's their statue, give it back to them. And the board agreed. So BDG uh, secured a recreation permit from the Montana Department of Transportation for a roadside park on MDT right-of-way uh, to place not only the statue, but kiosks and the wood sculptures uh, that you see there today to mark this place. Um, Two Rivers Memorial Park was designed by longtime Missoula landscape engineer, Rudd Jennings. For his Eagle Scout project, 14-year-old Kevin Fury proposed a plan that would provide a landing for the statue it involved the, the laying of railroad ties and leveling the area with soil and gravel as well as, um, as a chain barrier around the statue. Fury was joined by more than 50 volunteers, some of, the, some of them who are here today, from the Bonner Milltown community in preparing the landing site. And here you see, um, I think this is Mike Whitman, Correct. Um, he's helping uh, load load the monument from that um, intersection at Orange Street when the Holiday uh, gas station was there, and gas prices were dollar forty a gallon. <laughs> this was 1997 again, um, and so out out to Bonner it came. And, and that, some of you will recognize Al Belusky on the left there, um, unloading the truck. The BDG, um, Bruce Hall, provided these pictures, by the way. Last August, um, Leif Fredrickson came out from the university and gave us a walking tour that started at the, at the Milltown State Park, uh, the Confluence Park, and went to our kiosk and statue where, it's, where it is today. Somewhere I have my glasses. Anyway, um, 
It, he, he talked about the social, industrial, military, and historical forces that combined to produce the seven statues in Montana and uh, others in Idaho and Washington uh, more than 50 years after the Mullen Road was actually built. Leif is a Rattlesnake Middle School and Missoula Hillgate graduate. He received his master's degree from the University of Montana, a PhD from the University of Virginia, and is currently an assistant professor and um, director of the public health program, history program, I'm sorry, at the University of Montana. He's also on Missoula's Historic Preservation Commission and is a co-producer along with his sister Erica and the Dundas brothers of the award-winning podcast, Death in the West. So when he's not talking about Mullen monuments, ask him about Frank Little and D.B. Cooper. <laughs> so we are very pleased to welcome a man of his expertise to one of our programs today. And so Leif, take it, take it over. Can you guys hear me okay? Thanks, Kim, and thanks to all you guys for coming out. Um, thanks for the bon to the Bonner Milltown uh, History Museum. Um, so yeah, I'm, as Kim said, I'm Leif Fredrickson. I'm, uh, I teach history at the University of Montana. I grew up in Missoula. Um, and when I was growing up in Missoula, whoops, I'm going to keep talking for a minute. Uh, so. Um, I grew up, as Kim was discussing, there was, for a long time, there were two Mullen monuments in Missoula from the 50s until basically the end of the 20th century. Um, and I had just absolutely no consciousness of them at all. And um, I've learned, you know, that, that and I've now been, you know, interested in these Mullen monuments for a while now. But I'm always interested to ask other people about them. Um, now that there's, you know, even though there's just one in Missoula now, I often ask, you know, people, my friends and people I grew up with, you know, do you know, are you familiar with the John Mullen Monument? And many people don't know, don't know it. They don't know where it is. They don't, it's not even that they don't know who John Mullen is. They don't even know where the monument is. Um, so, um, and I think it's fair to say that the creators of this, you know, um, of this monument would be baffled by this. I mean, they had, they poured all kinds of effort and money into creating these monuments, having them built out of, you know, out of marble and placed in the most public places in Missoula and other uh, towns that they were placed in. Um, and you know, had big uh, unveiling ceremonies and so on that were, you know, very much publicized. Is it ready to go? Yeah, just okay. Um, that were very much publicized in, uh, in the press and all that sort of thing. Um, and yet today, you know, for, for many people, for, as a practical matter, they are, they're, they're almost invisible for a lot of folks. And um, just to show you some really amateur uh, um, Photoshopping skills I have, watch. Ah, he's gone. <laughs> but this is the uh, this was the you know big headline front page news of the, of the Missoulian when the, this monument here was put was put there. It's been moved a little bit since then, but it's basically in the same spot. Um, so um, in some ways, moment, you know monuments can become you know very invisible, recede into the background, as I'll talk more about in a second. But let me tell you another sort of uh, personal story to. to um, uh, sort of motivate why monuments are important. I, I went to graduate school at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. I got my PhD there, so I was there for a number of years. Um, and when I was there and I thought about history, it was all when I was in the classroom or reading books. You know, I walked around Charlottesville. I didn't pay much attention to what was there, including a huge statue of Robert E. Lee that was in a park called Lee Park. Um, I didn't think about that very much. Um, until the last year I was there in 2017, uh, when that, mon that uh, statue, that's the Robert E. Lee statue there at Lee Park that's been removed and the park's been renamed now, um, became a lightning rod uh, for a big rally of very, very extreme right-wing racists, uh, you know, basically neo-fascists, neo-Nazis, and so on. Um, and it was all, you know, I mean, it had to do with a lot of different things, but it was centered around that, uh, that uh, controversy over these Confederate monuments like the Robert E. Lee one. 
Um, and it was very, uh, you know, as one outcome of that was that a, a, a counter protester against these groups was murdered, was run over by a car. Um, and it was very, I mean, I was there. I took this picture and it was, <clears throat> it was surreal um, and unsettling and <clears throat> frankly uh, terrifying sort of event. Um, and I don't, you know, I'm not trying to be a downer here, but I, I just, you know, all of which is to say that monuments are, you know, they are important. They're complicated, they're interesting, and um, people invest them in, uh, with a lot of meaning in them. And sometimes that disappears, sometimes they disappear into the background, and other times they come, you know, roaring to the foreground. Um, so today I want to delve into, um, you know, these, our sort of most prominent local monuments, the, the Mullen statues. So I'm going to talk about these Mullen monuments. They were erect, uh, erected in the late uh, 19-teens in Montana and then some in Idaho and Washington. Um, uh, and talk a little bit about, you know, what basically sort of, you know, to think, to use them to think about, you know, how people, what people value at certain times. Um, how they think about historical memory, why history is important, um, and you know why we you know put these symbols um, in our landscape and so on. And it's complicated because different people at the same time you know see monuments in different ways. I mean, they're pieces of art, and like all art, they can be interpreted in various different ways. They're interpreted by different groups in different ways. They're interpreted over time in different ways, and so on. Um, so, um, you know, today we're going to, I'm going to be sort of delving into some of those issues. And I should say that um, my, my research here comes out of, um, I teach a local history class, Missoula local history class, and um, I decided to do research with my students on these monuments because this was at a time when, as a result of the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville and, and other uh, th events, there was a lot of interest in monuments, um, including our own local monuments. So. Me and my class did some research on these. I'm not an expert on monuments. I'm not an expert on John Mullen. Um, there's other people that know a lot more about John Mullen here, like, like Kim, and probably other people here as well. Um, but uh, but we, we researched this, and I've done some research since then. So um, I'm just going to talk about some of the, you know, what, what, what we've discovered. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, very briefly, about John Mullen and the John Mullen and the, and the Mullen Road, and then talk about the creation of these monuments, um, and some of the aftermath of them, and then, time permitting, um, uh, step back and talk a little bit more about monuments in general. <clears throat> All right, so <clears throat> um, Kim's uh, um, uh, said some of this stuff here, but um, uh, John Mullen was uh, a really important uh, figure in uh, the, our history and the, in the history of this region. He was uh, one of the key people that went al along with Isaac Stevens, who is the territorial governor of uh, Washington Territory, which was what, you know, what we're in right now was, a, was part of in the 1850s. They sent out a survey, the federal government sent out a survey in the, in the 1850s, 1853 to 1855, to survey the Northwest, to look for routes for building a railroad, and also to survey it for other resources and that sort of thing. That was led by Isaac Stevens, and um, uh, John Mullen was one of the key military uh, leaders that went along on that. Then about uh, 10 years later, um, as a result of, you know, based on evidence from that survey, uh, Mullen led um, the, the project that built the Mullen Road through this area. And it was, it was a military road, and it was marked as MR, which means military road, but it's, you know, pretty quickly became known as the Mullen Road. And it was a really important road because it was this first major road that could be, it was a pretty rough road still, but it was a road that could be um, traversed by stagecoach. Um, and it connected these points of, uh, you know, across the Rocky Mountain Great Divide from the upper reaches of the Missouri, as far as you could go up by steamship basically up there, Fort Benton, um, to the highest head of navigation on the Columbia, which was Walla Walla. So this is Fort Benton here. Um, and then, uh, you know, this is uh, Walla Walla down here. In between those is all of these mountains, as you can see on that map there. And right here is basically where we are, uh, Missoula area there. 
Um, so that was completed in the, in the early uh, 1860s. Uh, and, it, and it really, I mean, it, it started to really transform this region. It, it made it possible. It, it um, catalyzed the development of uh, more mining, gold mining in the region. It allowed more export and imports of some goods. It's still pretty limited because there's only so much you can ship out on a stagecoach. But nevertheless, you know, started the development of this area, including um, the development of the Missoula area. So. This was developed by Christopher Higgins, who was the wagon master uh, for John Mullen. Um, and after the Mullen Road was completed, he moved back to this area and set up a trading post at Hellgate, which is a few miles west of uh, Missoula, where Missoula is today. And then a few years later, in, in 1860, moved it to basically where downtown Missoula is now. Um, so set up a trading post, which, you know, again, is kind of right in the middle of this, this big road here that's going all this way and right in the middle of the Rocky Mountains there. So a good place for a trading post. <clears throat> um, so that's the kind of um, background of the, the road and why it was important. And then 50 years later, um, uh, uh, groups of people decided that they wanted to try to memorialize that road. This was after uh, the, the railroads came through in 1883. The Northern Pacific was built in 1883. Um, so that really, you know, uh, made the, the old uh, wagon roads obsolete, and then other, other transcontinental railroads followed that as well. Um, so 50 years later, this, this road had sort of, you know, either been uh, built over with other railroad track or had fallen into a lot of disuse. Um, <clears throat> and um, a number of people in the, in the 19 teens uh, decided that they wanted to try to memorialize this route and memorialize John Mullen. Um, and so they set up a number of, um, they, they produced a plan to set up a number of monuments along uh, the route of the Mullen Road. And ultimately that resulted in uh, seven monuments in Montana and six in Idaho. There are other monuments that were put in, uh, the, the Mullen Road went into Washington as well. While there weren't statues put in there, there were other types of monuments that were eventually put in there later in the 20th century. So um, this is this these Mullen monuments are um, they're really kind of the the most uh, the most prominent aspects of the monumentalized landscape of this you know Pacific Northwest uh, region that we are in, which suggests that they were you know the Mullen Road and John Mullen was very important to people at least or was very important to people in any case. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how this this all came about. <clears throat> so the key group that was involved with this was the Montana Society of Pioneers. The Society of Pioneers were created in 1884. And to be a member of the Society of Pioneers, you had to be living in uh, the state of Montana, or not the state of Montana, the, um, in the, what became the state of Montana in 1864, uh, 1864 or before, and also not, not be an Indian. Indians weren't uh, part of that. Um, so that was created in 1884. And um, you know, basically, the idea was to try to you know um, uh, capture the history of these early pioneers. <clears throat> um, and they, in the early 1900s, um, they you know they they first started out by uh, putting out publications and having meetings. They would they did a lot of biographies of families and individuals. And then in the early 1900s, they started um, tr trying to push for. Um, uh, putting in monuments uh, to remember certain important aspects of the history of Montana. And they did a, a, a number of those, but these John Mullen monuments were the most prominent and most important for them. Um, Charles Warren, who was one of their members, was the, apparently the person that came up with this. He was a miner uh, who m mined in Phillipsburg. He also started a newspaper there. Um, but then a guy named Frank Sandbar Brown is the main one who spearheaded this whole effort. That's um, uh, Frank Brown there. He was the, uh, the historian, uh, the staff historian for the Society of Pioneers, later became the president of it um, shortly after these, these monuments were created. <clears throat> um, he was uh, a Confederate veteran who, uh, after the Civil War, moved to Montana, started trapping, uh, did some mining, and so on. Um, and he got his name, Sandbar, um, because apparently, according to him, because uh, one time when he was out trapping, he was uh, being trailed by some Blackfeet Indians. He decided that they were going to try to ambush them. So he 
ambushed them instead. When they appeared around a corner, he shot them, both of them, uh, scalped them, and then threw them into the water by a sandbar. And that's how he says he got his nickname, Sandbar. Um, so uh, um, that's Frank Sandbar. And uh, there's a picture of him there. And there's his uh, certificate, which you got when you, you know, t to become a member of the Society of Pioneers. <clears throat> So in, in the, in the mid-19-teens um, is when the, uh, the Society of Pioneers really starts uh, looking into the idea of creating these monuments. The idea, according to them, is to tell the wayfarer a story of the frontier. Um, and according to Frank Brown, John Mullen was, uh, um, uh, you know, he was related to two of the most important events incidental to the earlier history of the state. Uh, which laid the present permanent foundation of physical and moral greatness it now enjoys. Um, so the Mullen Road was seen as important to the Society of Pioneers because of uh, what they saw as John Mullen's expertise and skill in creating surveys, uh, finding good routes, and ultimately uh, building a road that became critical to the settlement, uh, immigration to this area and settlement of this area. Now, the, the Mullen Road was built uh, ostensibly as a military road. It wasn't really used as a military road at all, uh, but it was used for my immigrants coming in uh, to, uh, to this area. And according to the Society of Pioneers claimed that 300,000 immigrants passed on this road, um, and it was you know, absolutely critical to the development of this area until the creation of the, the uh, Northern Pacific Railroad in 1883. And after that, it sort of uh, you know, fell into uh, disuse, was abandoned, and forgotten in many ways. And so they wanted to bring back, you know, uh, keep this memory of this important road. <clears throat> um, all right, so, um, so they, they developed this idea within their committee. They also um, asked the governor of Montana at that time to create a committee about uh, creating these monuments, which the governor does, which is mostly staffed by people from the Society of Pioneers. Um, all right, so um, we'll come back to that in a second here. So a key question, though, was how, how, how would this be funded? And um, Frank Brown decided that, um, that, uh, that these, he, would, he would push for each of these monuments. The idea was already to create a set of monuments in different towns along the route. And the idea was that each of these uh, monuments in different places would be funded um, by somebody else, and in particular, one or more of the women and men who had acquired wealth and worldly distinction that comes from the possession of it and had assisted um, in the development of the great commonwealth out of the primeval wilderness. That's, that's his quote there. So the idea is, you know, people who had benefited from this road ultimately um, and who had helped and further helped settle the area should be the people that would be funding these monuments. So they were each individually funded. Um, um, in Missoula, uh, that was funded by Jules Hannaford, the president of the Northern Pacific Railroad. Fort Benton was funded by the citizens of Fort Benton. Great Falls was funded by Cornelius F. Kelly, who was one of the very top corporate lawyers and managers for the Anaconda Company, which was one of the biggest corporations in the world at this point. Um, uh, Deer Lodge was funded by the sons and daughters of Captain uh, Mills, who was you know, related to this, um, uh, the Mullen Road. Um, uh, Bonner was, as uh, Kim mentioned, was funded by William Clark, who was a senator and also another sort of copper baron. He was one of the very wealthiest people in the United States, probably a top five wealthiest person in the United States. Um, and uh, the one at St. Regis was funded by uh, his son, William Clark, Jr. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the design and creation of these monuments, which I think also gives us a little glimpse into their meaning for people. Um, so uh, there were seven monuments created in Montana. They were all created from a single block of Vermont marble. So. Uh, marble that was carved out of uh, quarries in Vermont, and they're all fixed on a big concrete pedestal. Um, and these, this idea, you know, the, the, the creation of these marble uh, monuments or statues was a, a very prominent in this period, in the, in the early 20th century. 
And it was part of the, um, in some ways, of a much larger movement called the City Beautiful Movement. The City Beautiful Movement was a planning and architecture uh, movement that was sort of a response to the massive industrialization and urbanization that had happened in the, in the late 19th century. So this was a period of enormous industrial growth, and along with that, enormous growth of cities, large groups of immigrants moving into cities, and because of all that population, because of all the industry going on there, cities became very, very polluted, uh, very dirty in many ways. And the City Beautiful movement was an attempt to try to gain some order, uh, put some order onto cities, make them more beautiful, and so on. So part of that was creating parks, part of that was uh, erecting new buildings, and especially buildings in a, a, what's called a neoclassical style, which is just a style like the, the Greek and Roman sort of style, big pillars, symmetrical, suggesting order, white or, or light gray marble, and so on, just to suggest cleanliness and so on. And part of that was also creating uh, monuments, and, and monuments often put in squares and that sort of thing, to make these cities seem more orderly, to seem more beautiful. So this was all a part of that. There's lots of statues that go up at this time. Um, um, in addition, in terms of the particular sort of aspects of this statue, you can see here, this was an early design for the monument. And I'm not sure who, who made this design. Um, but you can see it's quite different. This is not how the monument ended up looking. This is John Mullen. And it looks a lot more like what you might expect a soldier from the US military to look like, right? Uh, like a, you know, a, a Union or Confederate soldier, anything like that. Um, that's sort of more like what they, what they actually would have looked like. But this is, this is a model uh, that is very much more like what the, the, the monument came to look like, which looks much more like a frontiers person, right? So the, again, the Society of the Pioneers, they're very, very much interested in the sort of frontier heritage. And while I don't know, you know, I don't know, I don't have any sort of particular textual documentation of the, of the design behind these, it seems pretty clear that they wanted something that looked more like a frontiersman, even if that's not exactly what John Mullen himself looked like. And so you can see here, here's the, the early model, and it looks pretty similar to what ended up being created there. <clears throat> now, one of the things, um, uh, and, the, and these, uh, the, the, there's some slight variations across these different monuments that are made. I mean, they're all carved out of marble, so you know there's uh, there's going to be some differences that come about. Uh, but they're they're all pretty similar. You can see originally they were put on a huge, a pretty tall pedestal like this. Many of them have been moved, or the pedestal has been broken because it's been run into by cars or something like that. Um, so some of those are gone. Um, and this this is one from this uh, one here is from Great Falls. Uh, this one is from Kellogg, Idaho. So even the ones that were uh, created in Idaho were basically built on this, pretty much the same exact design as the ones from Montana. Now, one of the things, uh, oh, and this just shows you some of the base. Kim already showed you some of this, but um, they, you know, they, they indicate some of the things. All these things, all the uh, um, monuments have this sort of thing on their base. Captain Mullen Trail, this is really weird, 1853 to 1855. The trail, or the road, was built in the early 1860s. This is the time when the uh, Isaac Stevens survey happened. And one of the things that's kind of interesting about this is uh, there's a lot of talk when, in the creation of these monuments about the need to understand and remember history. But frequently, <laughs> they, get, they get dates quite wrong, including in this case here. Um, so, uh, and this says, this is more accurate here. It says, you know, when this, when this was completed. And then all of them tell you know, who, who funded this particular one. This is the one from Missoula. So it says it's erected under the auspices of the Montana Society of Pioneers um, and uh, J uh, James Hannaford, the president of the Northern Pacific uh, Railroad Company. Um, now, one of the things that um, I, you know, has been kind of interesting about this, I, I've been trying to figure out who, who exactly designed these monuments. Um, and, when you, when you read most histories of these monuments, including there's entries, you know, the Smithsonian, for example, has cataloged various um, aspects of public art, including these monuments. And the creator of these is listed as Edgar Paxson, who was a famous painter, artist, 
uh, of the American West, who lived in Missoula, of course, Paxson uh, uh, School is where my, my child goes, and, and you know, it's named after him. The murals in the Missoula County Courthouse are painted by Edgar Paxson. He did a very famous painting of uh, Custer's Last Stand, and so on. So if you look anywhere about who created these uh, monuments, it's almost always attributed to Edgar Paxson. But I've had a lot of trouble uh, verifying that when I've lacked gone back and tried to look at the actual sources. So if you look through um, the minutes and reports of the Society of Pioneers, they don't mention anything about Edgar Paxson designing these, even though Edgar Paxson was a member of the Society of Pioneers. You can see this is a short uh, article from uh, the Missoulian uh, when uh, the statue was unveiled in Missoula. It talks about um, Edgar Paxson. It says, Edgar Paxson entertained a dinner last Tuesday evening in compliments of General E.S. Godfrey, who came from Washington, a United States Army uh, captain, who came there to, um, to see the unveiling of the John Mullen Monument in Missoula. So it talks about Edgar Paxson and how, you know, how he's like, you know, he's entertaining these people from Washington for this unveiling. It says nothing about him designing the monuments, which seems pretty odd. Like, you'd probably put that in an article if he did that. Um, so, and then the other thing I did was I went and tried to uh, and found Edgar Paxson's diaries uh, from, this, uh, from this period because I was interested if maybe, maybe he mentioned something about this. He was at the unveiling of this. And here's what he says. Uh, here's his diary entry for, for this day when, when these uh, statues were unveiled in Missoula. He said, he, uh, he talks about how there was seven auto loads of loaded with pioneers who were staying at the hotel in Missoula and went, went to the site of the, um, the unveiling in Missoula. Uh, he rode with Frank Sandbar Brown, who's a friend of his, and so on. And then, and then he writes, uh, while this shaft marks the first long trail, it is far from being a work of art or truthfully representing the bulldozer of that day, which, by which he means John Mullen, or the period for which I... Or, or the period, for which I am sorry indeed. In the future, I hope more thought and attention will be paid to details to, of, of memorials. So it doesn't sound like he created it. It doesn't sound like he even likes it very much. So I don't think that he, he probably did that. Now, I, I was interested, maybe, maybe this comes from, maybe the, whoever designed it like drew inspiration from something that Edgar Paxson did, which is possible. He painted a lot of pictures of people in buckskins with guns and various things. And I was looking through a book of his art, and, and the, the, the image that actually looked most similar to that is this image, which is a, just a photograph of Edgar Paxson himself dressed in buckskins, which he liked to do. So I'm curious if whether you know, maybe the inspiration is actually just this photo of, of Edgar Paxson himself. But in any case, it's, it's a mystery, although I don't, I don't think there's very little evidence that Edgar Paxson actually uh, had any hand in, in uh, designing these. Uh, who they were designed by... I mean, who they were created by. Um, what you can see down here, um, the, uh, uh, the uh, Western Montana Marble um, and Granite Company, which was a company in Missoula that made gravestones and that sort of thing and were contracted out. And so I think it's very likely that they actually, in addition to making them themselves, to making the, the monuments, uh, they actually designed them themselves. <clears throat> and perhaps, again, drew inspiration from something, but, but certainly not... It uh, doesn't seem like uh, Edgar Paxson designed them. <clears throat> All right, so let, let me talk a little bit more about um, the, the statue that went into Missoula. Missoula was the first one that was put in. Um, and um, the reason that Missoula was first was that uh, the Society of Pioneers saw Missoula as having a, a special relationship to John Mullen. Mullen had, had various camps uh, close to Missoula, including the one out here, one down the Bitterroot. He came through the Missoula area multiple times. And he had a connection. Uh, one, uh, several of the people that had worked on the survey came back to Missoula and lived there, including, including Frank Higgins and some other people um, who worked on there as well. Um, so it had a, you know, a special connection to Missoula, and that was seen as the, you know, the place to have it. Initially, they wanted to have it during uh, Missoula's Pioneer Days or Missoula's Stampede, uh, which was going to be on July 4th. And you can see advertisements for that here. It says uh, in the, from the paper, and they say, you know, in unveiling the first Mullen Trail monument. Uh, this one says, unveiling the monument to Captain John Mullen, who built the military road through this part of the Northwest in 1868. No, not quite. But... Um, 
But in any case, the, the, the unveiling of this was supposed to be, you know, a big, uh, part of these monuments, the building of these monuments, had many aspects to them. But part of them was a tourism thing, right? The idea of getting people to come to areas, sort of an early form of heritage tourism. And so they're, they're advertising that in this. It turns out the statue wasn't uh, ready by the time of the 4th of July. The Missoula Marble and Granite Company had not been able to complete it, and so they had to put it off. They were very disappointed about that. But they decided to have it at the Western Montana Fair, which was in October, uh, on October 5th of that same year, 1916, if I didn't mention that. Um, so that's when they actually ended up unveiling it. Um, and um, they had it, they, they put it by the Northern Pacific Depot, which is near there today, uh, but in a, in a little different context. It was in this little garden area. This is just to the east of uh, where the, the main depot is. Um, and they had a big, a big celebration of this, as I mentioned before, as Edgar Paxson says, seven automobiles filled with pioneers. Lots of people um, you know, coming from Missoula and other parts of the state, people coming from across the nation, some um, uh, military leaders and so on for the unveiling of this. Um, <clears throat> uh, so a few people spoke there. Charles Warren, who as I mentioned was this Phillipsburg miner, newspaper man, uh, who, had, who had kind of initiated this idea of creating these Mullen monuments. Um, and he, he spoke there, he said, um, May it stand long as a token of the honor which a grateful people bestow upon conspicuous and unselfish devotion to public duty. His life and example remain an incentive and inspiration to noble manhood for all time to come. He represented a high type of American citizenship, brave, patriotic, and self-sacrificing for his country's welfare. Now, this is 1916. Uh, this is, you know, in the middle of World War I. Um, and so, you know, you can see then there are many people who are advocating for, you know, a stronger role uh, for the United States in World War I. Um, and so this is probably shaped very much by um, the, some of the battles over what to do um, in World War I, uh, what the United States should do in terms of World War I. The main speaker was a guy named uh, William J. McCormick, uh, whose uh, his father um, had been a, was a member of the Society of Pioneers, the McCormick family you probably know from McCormick Park, very prominent family uh, in the Missoula area. Um, and McCormick said, um, it has been forcibly remarked by a famous historian that a people that does not take pride in the achievements of its ancestors will never leave anything behind that will excite the just, that will excite the just pride of its descendants. So some part of the idea is a sense of these need to be put there, you know, to sort of um, uh, keep people interested in trying to uh, push the progress of, uh, you know, their civilization further. Um, and then, and then he, he sort of ends up with this note. He says, he's talking about John Mullen here, and he says, could he step down in flesh from his marble monolith whereon his image is inlaid in bronze and mingled with, the, with this assembly now gathered to pay him tribute. It wasn't bronze, I don't know why he said that, but um, what wondrous changes would overwhelm his senses? He would gaze upon a land, once the empire of the Indian, where the white man seldom ventured, now altered to, a, to the republic of the white man, where Indian is the guest or a tenant at will. So think about that for a second. Altered to the republic of the white man where the Indian is the guest. Um, and I think it's useful here to step back for a second and think about, we have a lot of evidence of what, you know, the Society of Pioneers and some other people thought about these monuments. We don't have, I mean, as, as far as I've been able to discover, no direct sort of evidence of what Native Americans thought of a monument like this at the time. But we can get a little bit of a sense of that by thinking about what this Mullen Road uh, maybe meant to Native Americans in general. Um, so um, one of the, the, the camp that was here uh, that uh, Kim mentioned was called Cantonment Wright. And that was named after uh, one of John Mullen's uh, superiors named George Wright. Um, so when after the, the, um, uh, the Isaac Stevens survey was, was done in the 1850s, after that, uh, Stevens and Mullen started pushing for the development of this Mullen Road, which was, again, as I said, ostensibly supposed to be a military road. 
However, the military actually, people like George Wright in the Northwest, did not want the road to be built. They thought building the road was a bad idea because it would inflame tensions between Native Americans and white people in the area. Now, there were a lot of other reasons to want to build the road. For settlement, it would, for people who were territorial governors or people who lived in territories, it might help bring them statehood more quickly for e economy and commerce and so on. And for people like Mullen, it might be for to show you know, the prowess of his engineering and so on. Uh, but in any case, many military people were actually quite uh, skeptical about the idea that this was a good idea to build a road through here. But eventually it was, of course, funded by Congress and built. And um, in the building of it, it did inflame uh, many uh, tensions with Native Americans. Now, Native Americans in this area, I and mean, one of the things that had been, happened during the survey um, in the 1850s with, with Stevens and Mullen was a deliberate attempt not just to survey the area, but to make treaties with Native American tribes that would open up areas for settlement and for the building of transportation routes. So the, treaty, the Hellgate Treaty of 1855, which was uh, uh, a treaty made with uh, the Salish and Ponderé and Kootenai, just west of Missoula, uh, that created the Flathead Reservation that we have today. Um, and moved Native Americans, whose homeland this was, we talked about, away from areas like the Missoula Valley, which, which were seen as uh, you know, prime routes for the building of a railroad. <clears throat> um, now, Native American tribes were very varied in sort of their, their responses to um, treaties and white settlement and so on, because they had their own sort of internal conflicts with, with different tribes. And so some tribes, like the Salish, who, uh, who were you know, needed allies, especially in their fight against their enemies like the Blackfeet, were more receptive to things like white settlement and making uh, allies with whites. Others were very, uh, very concerned about white settlement. Um, and they were all, of course, in, in a way concerned about white settlement. They just you know, didn't necessarily have all the options of, of being able to resist that. So some tribes in uh, what is now you know, western Washington and parts of uh, Idaho were very hostile to the building of this Mullen Road. They saw it as an incursion into their homeland. And as a result of that, a number of uh, conflicts, violent conflicts, emerged in the early 1860s. George Wright, who again, as I said, was a person who was not really in favor of this road, but nevertheless was in charge of the military in some of these regions, um, was charged with putting down some of these conflicts between uh, Native Americans. And that resulted in a series of uh, violent conflicts, some atrocities committed on both sides, um, and ultimately uh, Wright uh, uh, infamously hung some of the leaders of uh, the Native Americans in that area. Um, and you know, from the tribal perspective, I mean, we have one Coeur d'Alene uh, tribal elder that stated, we didn't want to go to war, but what do you do when someone breaks into your home? So there were lots of, I mean, so you can get a sense. I mean, there was Salish and Nez Perce were helping John Mullen to, you know, they were working as guides to help build this road. So there was, the, the relationship was complicated, but there was definitely many Native Americans uh, who saw this as a real threat to their homelands and their survival and their way of life. Now, the Society of Pioneers, um, I think, had kind of two related but, but somewhat different sort of approaches to Native Americans, thinking about Native Americans. Some of them, like Edgar Paxson, had very strong, you know, had often strong relationships with, with uh, Native Americans. Um, and they, you know, they were, they were friends with them. Um, they revered them in some ways, uh, but they also saw their way of life as, you know, inevitably fading away. Right? They, they saw it as, you know, it was, it was going to go away. It had to disappear. Um, there was nothing that could be done, you know, to stop it. And in some ways, they looked back in nostalgia on the frontier days, um, and they, and in part, in that nostalgia included Native Americans. Native Americans were necessarily part of that sort of nostalgic story of the frontier, but. The purpose, the whole purpose of the settling of the frontier at the same time was to, uh, you know, was to move Native Americans out of the way for white settlement. And so, um, and, and then, you know, uh, some people, some had a somewhat more harsh view of that, which was just simply that it was good uh, that Native, America, Native Americans were an obstacle to white settlement, and the sooner they could be moved out of the way, the better. And that was, you know, something of the, the view of, of W.J. McCormick and people like Frank uh, Sandbar Brown as well. 
<clears throat> All right. So the Missoula Monument um, it goes up in uh, October of 1916. That's the first one. Several others are put up. There's seven in all that are put up across the Montana, a few in the end of 1916, and a few at the be in 1917. So one goes up in Fort Benton. Again, this is sort of the beginning of the John Mullen route. Um, Deer Lodge, Great Falls. This is Paris Gibson Park. Paris Gibson was the, another industrialist. Um, and he, he was, had funded this park where the, um, the, the Mullen Monument went in. And then uh, Bonner here, which Kim has already talked a little bit about. But the Bonner one, I'm not actually sure when the Bonner one was erected because it was not the last one erected, but it was the last one which, which was dedicated in, in October of 1917. Um, and uh, the dedication uh, coincided with um, the uh, Association of Montana Journalists uh, convention in Montana. And so a big part of that was them coming out to this monument um, in October. Um, and uh, Dean Stone, who was the head of the journalism department at the University of Montana, gave, gave the talk at the dedication here. And uh, he was, I mean, Dean Stone was a guy who wrote for a living, but he nevertheless said, I wish that there was someone in my place who could pay tribute uh, worthy of the man to whom we dedicate this monument today. He said, as long as Montana endures, the name of Mullen should be remembered as one of the first to let the East know of the greatness of the treasure state. Um, so that one was created there. This is, a, uh, uh, I think it's supposed to be a, a, a sketch of the cantonment Wright, which is um, in this area. That was the one that was named after George Wright. And then the last monument was put up in St. Regis. This was the furthest one uh, west in Montana. Um, <clears throat> and um, um, this one uh, um, was put up, uh, the dedication for this was the 4th of July in 1917. And the Daily Missoulian wrote, um, uh, wrote a, an article on it and it said, uh, the writer in the Missoulian lamented uh, that the current gasoline generation has lost appreciation of the service of such men as Captain John Mullen. So I think from that you get a little bit of a sense of also, you know, now we've had sort of two revolutions in transportation in this area. You've had the Mullen Road coming through um, and then the railroad and now the automobile is starting to be built. Some of the earliest automobile roads have already been built through here, the Yellowstone Trail, and then in the 1920s, uh, you have the building of Highway 10. But there's already a lot of automobile use. And you can see this is St. Regis here. Uh, this is, there's the mo monument over there. I'm not sure the exact date of this, but and a big <laughs> shell, shell gas station right there. Um, so the, the Missoulian author said uh, uh, that the last monument at St. Regis must arrest the most thoughtless traveler, declaring John Mullen as one of the greatest heroes of Montana. And they concluded that the monuments would be a reminder to the strong, bold man who opened the West that has since been for, uh, forgot, that has since forgot and neglected him. So that was the last one put up in Montana. Um, and then um, the Society of Pioneers from the very beginning uh, had the idea that, you know, they would try to get people in Idaho, uh, similar organizations in Idaho to, to, uh, and Washington to put up to put up monuments as well. Idaho does end up doing that. Uh, they put up six monuments um, in a bunch of towns along the, the Mullen Road there. Uh, one of these is that 4th of July Pass, which is, you know, where the interstate goes today and, you know, was part of the Mullen Road. Um, and then a number of towns. This one's uh, Wallace. And you can see here, <coughs> um, they just put <laughs> this, this one right in the middle of the street so you, you don't miss it there. It's been moved, of course, since then. Uh, but a bunch of monuments, again, very similar to the ones in Montana, go up in Idaho. Washington doesn't put up those monuments, but it puts up other ones like uh, markers like this one. Um, and it does that through the, the, the 30s and afterwards. <clears throat> so the whole idea of these is, you know, I mean, you, you know, is to, to make people, to try to force people to not forget the importance of John Mullen to this region, right? I mean, that's the whole, you put these things in the most public squares, or in Wallace, you just you know, put them in the middle of the street, so you really can't miss it. Um, but it doesn't really work out that way so well for many of these. Uh, this is the uh, monument up at uh, 4th of July uh, Pass. 
Um, and you can see, you know, as I said, in, in, the, in the 1920s, Highway 10 is built through, goes up over this same area. Um, and there's, there's where it's located along there. There's also a tree that John Mullen blazed uh, that was located near that. Um, but very quickly, especially with all the automobile traffic, there's a, a lot of vandalism of these monuments. Uh, you can see this is a, a story from the 1920s, I think, that shows all sorts of paint over this. People would uh, put, write their names on it. Uh, somebody blew up uh, the face of this uh, monument up a Fourth of July Pass with, with dynamite. They would shoot it and that sort of thing. So the monuments weren't really so revered uh, uh, as the, the society the pioneers had hoped. Um, and you can see this is um, one of the things that a lot of places did with monuments, including the John Mullen Monument, was put up fences around them. So you can see, I mean, these girls are no doubt just about to to vandalize this, but fortunately there's, <laughs> there's a sharp uh, wrought iron fence around that, but many of the monuments had those put around them. The, the John Mullen tree up at 4th of July Pass had that around it. A lot of them had that put up. This is a, another picture of the one at 4th of July, and you can see this face is pretty messed up from being blown up with dynamite. Um, and when I, so when I first looked at this, I was like, this, this looks like, like somebody I know. Does anybody think this looks like somebody? Country music singer of any kind? That's, uh, maybe it's just me and my wife both, I was like, look at this, who does this look like? And we're both country music fans, and she was like, that is Hank Williams Jr. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so these, these, uh, these monuments, they weren't, you know, they, they faced a lot of, uh, uh, of vandalism and uh, that sort of thing uh, pretty quickly. Um, they also, um, maybe even more than, than that, they, they really start to sort of fade into the background over time. So a lot of these pictures that I've showed you so far, many of them are, are postcards. And a lot of postcards of these monuments and other monuments in the early 20th century. That was a big time for postcards. That's how many people communicated. It was like a form of entertainment. You'd sell, send postcards to your friends and you would look at them. This was before TV and all that kind of stuff. And that was how, that was how you, you know, learned about the world in many ways. And the, the monuments were on a lot of these postcards. These are both early postcards of the Missoula Monument. <clears throat> and um, uh, another thing about postcards um, is that they, they would alter them to, to make them try to fit the times more. So look at this one. This is the same same photo, basically, that's been colorized, and then they changed the cars. <laughs> you see that? Uh, to make it, uh, I'm not actually sure which one is older, but uh, they tried to like update it to look, to look more modern. But um, this is another postcard, the Missoula one. Uh, lots of these had postcards. Um, so they're prominent. They're, they're, again, this is part of tourism for a place and so on. These, these monuments are part of a sort of early heritage tourism. But over time, that really, these really start to fade into the background. You can actually see that in some postcards here. This is one of um, uh, Fort Benton. Everybody probably knows the Shep Monument at Fort Benton. Probably not many people know the John Mullen Monument, which is there in the background. <laughs> Here's the Bull Shipping Center. Drummond had another one. And there's John Mullen in the background there. <laughs> um, and another sort of indication of the sort of uh, um, uh, loss of stature of these monuments is that many of them were moved, right? Um, and a part of this was because, you know, places like Wallace that put them in the middle of the road, when the automobile becomes much more prominent, they're often moved for that reason. Um, this one in Missoula was moved in 1955, um, and it was moved um, in part as part of a, a uh, the bringing in of a, a, a locomotive to this area um, that was also sort of be, supposed to be part of the prominent sort of landscape here. I'll show you that in a second. But one of the things that happens when they remove this uh, from its base is that they find that the, um, the Mullen monuments, they, the creators of them had put time capsules in them, which is another suggestion of, you know, the importance they saw. These, they, they expected these things to be found at some point. Um, and they, they were just like a newspaper from the time and the, and the, the speech that, were, that was given, that uh, W.J. McCormick speech that I read you part of. That's what was in the Missoula one. 
Um, there was one, uh, the, the uh, monument in Great Falls, there's also a mention of a time capsule there. I think they probably all had time capsules in them, but since people didn't, part of, people forgot about that. And so when they went to be moved, probably many of those time capsules were not recovered. They were just, you know, crushed or something like that. Uh, but that's the time capsule there. There's the monument being moved. Um, and in Missoula, it's moved um, to this location. It's been moved again since then. Uh, but this is a, an engine uh, that's still there. Um, and it's a very fitting scene in many ways. John Mullen, the whole uh, point of John Mullen's expedition and road was not just to build a wagon road, but to lead the way for railroads coming in. So you can kind of see him. It's, it's well placed. He's sort of leading this railroad through here. This was an a engine that was uh, worked for many years hauling logs. It, it hauled people out of the big 1910 fire disaster in Idaho and Montana, uh, and then crashed into the Bitterroot and was uh, recovered from there and brought to the, the, the depot in Missoula. So they moved the monument there. Um, but still, um, you know, it wasn't, you know, it's still it's sort of being, it's sort of being out, out, outshone by this much bigger monument in a way to, to industry and so on. Um, it also is a place where um, it's, it's pretty neglected. And this is photo here is from the uh, uh, 19, I think it's from the late 50s, maybe the 60s. Um, but it's uh, some students that took it upon themselves to try to clean up this area around the monument, which had just been filled with beer cans and that sort of thing. So it wasn't, a, it wasn't really a monument that was real respected in Missoula by this point. <clears throat> Um, uh, Kim's already talked a little bit about this, but um, the, they were also moved um, from Bonner to Missoula. And this is, you can see this right here, this little red circle. This is where the monument was originally placed, out here. Uh, right by the railroad, where if you're coming through on the railroad, everybody would see it. But then the highways are built, you know, the early highways, uh, Highway 10, and then other ones are built through here, further away from this. and the the sense is that people aren't, aren't going to see this monument anymore because they're not riding, riding rails anymore. There may be still goods being shipped on railroads, but it's just, it's just much less uh, prominent form of transportation. So they decide to move that to Missoula. Again, a sense that these monuments are not, you know, they're being neglected in some ways. Uh, and they move it to this spot, as, as Kim mentioned, here at um, Front and Main Street and Orange here. <clears throat> uh, that was a, you know, again, that's a pretty good spot for, I mean, that's a pretty central location for Missoula. Um, it's also a place where apparently there was a lot of drunk driving because it was hit many times by drunk drivers there. Uh, this is one of them trying to, to fix it after that. And I think the face on the, the monument out here that's, is a little uh, worse for the wear because of some of these uh, collisions. Um, so it's put in Missoula. And then, but again, you know, um, the, the whole idea is that it's going to be, you know, placed in, a, in an area where it will be more prominent. It's not really clear to me. There's really not much in the newspaper on the monument or anything like that. Um, and again, as I said, I mean, you know, it was something that was there for much of my life, and I, I never really uh, uh, knew much about it. But uh, then it's moved again, you know, in the, in, uh, later back to Bonner. <clears throat> All right, so... I'm just going to take a few minutes here just talking, talking about monuments a little bit more broadly, and then I'll stop and we can do questions or whatever. <clears throat> um, the, uh, there's been, a, as I said, a lot of interest in monuments, in part because of concern or, uh, about Confederate monuments in particular. Uh, this is a graph here of the creation of uh, Confederate monuments. And one of the things that's interesting for historians is to think about why there are big spikes in the creation of monuments at different times. And one argument about this, this shows a bunch of Confederate monuments being created in the late 19th and early 20th century, and then later in the 1950s and 60s. And one of the arguments is that these were created precisely in to sort of uh, um, in reinforce white supremacy, especially in the South, the idea that whites are in control, we're going to put up Confederate monuments that give a sense of, you know, and many of these uh, Confederate monuments were deliberately designed in a way to sort of, uh, you know, make the argument that slavery was not central to the Civil War and that sort of thing. Um, so that's part of the argument there. Now, it's, that, and, and part of the reason that they argue that is because that's the sort of thing that people said when they put those monuments up, right? So it's not just 
the, the pattern of it here, but this is actually the sort of thing that people said when they put these, these monuments up. But it's also a little bit more complicated than that. You can see here, there's also a lot of union monuments that are created at the same time, right? So, I mean, this is, in the, in, especially in the 19-teens, which is the period that we're talking about, that's the 50th anniversary of the Civil War. It's a period when a lot of Civil War veterans are passing away. Um, so it's probably also shaped by those sorts of things, as well as the broader sort of architectural and planning movements that I mentioned before, the city beautiful movement, all that kind of stuff. Um, and similarly, I think with the Mullen monuments, I mean, they are, this is the 50th anniversary, uh, close to the 50th anniversary when they're created to the creation of the Mullen Road. It's a time, and they, and the, Society of the Pioneers talk about this quite explicitly, a time when many of these early pioneers are dying off. Uh, Edgar Paxson, who's one of, the, you know, dies just a few years after this and so on. Um, so there's a sense of, you know, some of these old timers who have this knowledge are dying and, and there's a need to memorialize them um, at that time. <clears throat> there's also probably a connection between some of these. As I mentioned, uh, Frank Brown was a Confederate veteran. He was a member of some of these Confederate uh, veteran organizations who were some of the key, uh, they, they, were, they were behind the creation of many of these Confederate monuments in the South. And so there's probably, you know, they're probably getting ideas from other organizations like that who are creating these monuments um, as well. And another aspect of this, is, and I touched on this a little bit before, is the context of World War I. And this is a time when, um, you know, there's a great push for uh, uh, patriotism, for men to join the war, for people to buy war bonds and so on. But there's also a lot of conflict over that. Many immigrants, especially Irish immigrants, many Scandinavian immigrants who are very prominent in the Bonner area, for example, are not in favor of going to war. Finnish immigrants do not, are not interested in going to war on the side of the Russian Empire, which has a colonial relationship with Finland. Or Irish immigrants are not interested in going to war with Britain, who has a colonial relationship with Ireland, and so on. Many workers don't see the war, war as being in their interest. And there are a lot of strikes, including many in Montana in this period, in the lumber industry, in the copper industry in Butte, uh, that become very violent conflicts. And Kim mentioned that I work on a, um, a podcast, one of which is about the murder of this um, a union organizer in Butte in 1917 named Frank Little, who was a member of a radical uh, labor organization called the Industrial Workers of the World. And uh, he was lynched, um, uh, killed in a very brutal way, um, and it, nobody was ever uh, tried for it, and you know, there's been no uh, sort of definitive uh, um, idea of a definitive sort of statement of who did it, although many people feel that the Anaconda Copper Mining Company was involved. But um, what you see here is a letter from Frank Brown from 1918, so this is after this, but he is talking about how Missoula has a strong defense committee. Defense committees were uh, committees that were created in many states during World War I that were uh, pushed uh, very vigorously and sometimes violently for uh, patriotic support of the war. Uh, he says the IWW, which is the Industrial Workers of the World, no longer infests uh, its streets or distributes uh, their propaganda. And uh, um, the committee uh, confidently um, expect to hang one of them in the near future as an example to those who buy neither liberty bonds or other things. So um, there's no discussion, you know, when you look at the, the records of the Society of Pioneers, they're not saying we're, we're creating these monuments to try to reinforce patriotism during the war or anything like that. Um, but you have to consider that, that context and that these people who are advocating for these you know, also have a lot of other interests. And you can see a little bit of the advocacy of, of patriotism and support for the war and so on in some of the, the things that I've mentioned. Um, so um, I think that's, I will stop there if there's any else I wanted to mention. Um, I'm just going to stop there and we can, you know, discuss other ideas about, you know, the meaning and impetus between, be behind these sort of monuments. Um, so I'll just open it up for questions for any of you. Yeah. So you were talking about, um, there's some question on whether Paxson was involved in the design. Yeah. Is there, is there any mention of anybody else that might have been involved? The only mention... 
Yeah, no. The only mention is of the, um, the marble and granite company in Missoula that actually made them. So, uh, yeah, I haven't found any other, any other mention of designers or anything like that. Yeah. So do all the faces look the same then? Yep. They look pretty much the same, except various ones have had <laughs> things done to them since then. Yeah. But so the one in Missoula, I don't even know how it happened, but one in Missoula is his nose broken off. And, yeah, but they look pretty similar. Yeah. We'd like to have the questioners talk into a Okay. Sure. Yes. We can, can we bring it to them or? Yeah, yeah. I, I will. Anybody have a question? I was just going to ask, is there any information about what it cost per monument to have it made? Mm. That's a good question. I, I'm sure that I've come across that, but I don't, I don't have it uh, right in front of me. I think they were pretty expensive, though. Um, and so, you know, there was, I mean, the, the people that funded them, many of them were quite wealthy. Some of them were, were more modest folks. Um, but I think they definitely took a lot of money. And this is one of the things that's, you know, at least interesting when you think about monuments is that it's people are deciding to spend their money in a certain way. It's not, it's not cheap to build these things out of solid marble and hire somebody to do that and all that stuff. So I don't, I don't know the exact amount, but it was, they were expensive. Yeah. Uh, concerning the uh, Missoula uh, Mullen monuments, are they, uh, th there was two of them, I guess, is that correct? And one is now here in, in Bonner. And uh, where is the other one then, or is it, is there one still in Missoula that? <laughs> yeah, this is what I'm talking about. People don't know where it is. Yes, yeah, so there was, when they were first put up, one was put in Bonner and one was put in Missoula at the Northern Pacific Railroad Depot. And that one at the Northern Pacific Railroad Depot has always been there. It's been moved at least twice, once uh, mentioned in the 50s, and then once, I think, in the 70s when they did some refiguring for, like, the farmer's market and that sort of thing. The, uh, the one in Bonner was moved to Missoula in the 1950s uh, when there was a belief it wasn't getting enough attention in Bonner and then moved back to Missoula in the late 1990s or early 2000s. Which one was it, Kim? 1997, yeah. Yeah. So where is the one at? It's at the Northern Pacific Depot, yeah, so okay. the very northern end of Higgins. Higgins, yeah, yeah. Right by the X's. Yeah, right by the X's, yeah. Where's the one in St. Regis? Where's the one in St. Regis? Um, so uh, let, me, let me go back. You know, originally, this is where it was, and I believe, I'm not sure the exact layout now, but I believe it is now um, sort of on the north side of where that sort of major, <laughs> the downtown of St. Regis is or whatever, where the main sort of travel plaza is right where you come off the interstate. I'm not sure exactly though, yeah. I can answer that a little more right. exclusively. Um, in, eight, in 1989, um, Mineral County Museum began these Mullen Road, what they called Mullen Road Days. Uh, and that was in conjunction with moving the monument down the street to where it is today. If you go past the, the talking bird in St. Regis, the monument is is on that street where you where you mentioned, and um, at that time they had some descendants of John Mullen at the ceremony, and then they had a program that day. So um, that was the start of what what is now the Mullen Road Conference. That uh, we're going to have the continuation of in June. <laughs> uh, thanks. So Leif, one thing I'm still kind of confused about, are the monuments in honor of the Mullen Road, or are they in honor of John Mullen? Because I think there's, or are they yeah. too intertwined to really tell? No, that's a great question. I think they're intertwined. Um, they definitely, um, I mean, one of the things, they very much talk about John Mullen as a person, many frequently in the dedication of these and the creation of them initially. 
Um, but um, uh, I, I think part of that is also a way in which we tend to memorialize or heroicize aspects of the past where we identify certain things with an individual, even though many people were involved in the creation of the, the Mullen Road. Um, so it's kind of the way in which, I think it's a way in which uh, historical memory works where you sort of take one individual who encapsulates something like the building, building of the Mullen Road, which obviously John Mullen was very central to, but not the only person involved with. Um, but in terms of what the Society of Pioneers said, they talk about him as an individual. They attribute the, the success of the Mullen Road to his genius and moral character and that sort of thing. Yeah. What happened to John Mullen? <laughs> um, that's a good question. Kim, Kim might know more. I mean, he went on, um, he worked in, he, he went to California. He worked in state politics there. Um, he was very uh, involved in the sort of anti-Chinese immigrant movement in, in California. He worked in real estate there. And I don't remember exactly when he died, but that's, I don't know. Kim, do you, do you know more about, I remember that. I don't know too much more, and I know some people here know more about his connection with the railroads. Um, but he died in about 1910, mm -hmm. and at that time he was in he was back in Washington D.C. He was from Annapolis, Maryland, and he was a lawyer and had uh, um, many connections out here still when he was in Washington D.C. In terms of um, for one thing, opening up the Flathead Reservation, as I understand. So. Oh, okay. so I'm curious whether or not John Mullen was Isaac Stevens commissioned or federal government commissioned. Is that clear yet? Uh, what, what do you... Was John Mullen commissioned by Isaac Stevens? I think... Uh, you're like, did he get his orders from? Yeah, who was who? Who gave him orders to do what he was? I think it was the the federal government, the military. That because did. at the point that he did this, it was still we were still we Montana was still Washington Territory, correct? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I th I you know, this is something I don't know all the details of. I think Stevens and him were both very strong boosters of creating the road, but I think that his superiors were, his technical superiors were the, with the military, yeah. So they would have been the ones who, who, Congress was ultimately the one that gave funding for the road, and then I think the military said, you're going to be the one who will go out and, and do this, yeah. Any other questions? I'll add one more thing. Um, the there's another Missoula and Bonner connection to the Mullen Road or the Mullen Monuments. Um, it, they were originally commissioned by, and I want to get this right, the Mes Western Montana Monument and what is it called? <laughs> Western Marble Mo and Granite. Marble and Granite Company. That company is still in existence today as Garden City Monument. And um, the the people that run Garden City Monument, Bob and Michelle Jordan, live out here in the Bonner area, and they, I feel guilty because I haven't gone in, but they have offered to look at the records from the 1915 and 1916 era that this... Um, um, the gentleman, I can't, I can't remember his name, but he was, he had formed that that monument com company, and it was basically where, uh, at that time, was where the Iron Horse on North Higgins is today. So within a block of the yeah. of the Missoula Monument. So. Yeah, we got to go down there and check that out. Were all of the monuments then made in Missoula? Um, they were made. They were made by a Missoula company, but they were made out of Vermont marble, and I'm not sure where 
like if they shipped a block of marble here and then they were made, I'm not sure about that, or if they made them out there in Vermont. But they were all made by the same company, yeah. Any other questions? Anybody else? <laughs> All right. Well, All right. thank thank you so thank much. Thank you guys so much. Thank, thank you. you.